Good morning, everybody. My name is Rick Thompson, for those who don't know, and I want to welcome you in this house on this Mother's Day service. Mamas, we love you. And even as Sean took the opportunity to point out his, uh, his lovely wife as, as his mom, I want to point out my lovely wife, Deborah. Come on, mother of my four children. Happy Mother's Day, and happy Mother's Day to my mom who's in the house as well. If there were ever two women who needed a medal having to deal with me, they are in this house. You didn't have to say amen. You didn't have to say it so loud that I heard you. Anyway, we, if you, we're in a series called A Fuller House. Say A Fuller House. And I'm going to try to get you, oh, wow, you gave me 15 minutes. This is awesome. Okay, let's just make sure that everyone has an outline. If you don't have an outline, raise your hand because we've got to get one into your hands. Just raise your hand. Make sure you got one. All right, so this message is, is really our, our theme verse for this message is based on John 10.10, 10, which says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the, help me out somebody, have it to the full. And some translations say to the fullest. fullest. And I pointed out last week that he didn't say that, that you're going to have a perfect life if you accept him. Come, how many of you know the perfect don't exist on this planet? Come on somebody. The only time we're gonna, things are going to be perfect is when you get to heaven. In the meantime, we're the, in the in between time. And he says, though, if you accept me into your life, if you allow me to, 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 to be Lord of your life and to lead your life, I can make your life fuller or better. And there's always room for improvement in terms of get things in, uh, getting better. Amen? Amen? If you have a great, if you have a bad relationship, uh, uh, in a, you know, your relationships with your husband, your wife, your children, things could definitely get better. Come on, somebody. If you have a good relationship and things are going cool, things could still get better. And so you're in the right place at the right time, all right? And this is Mother's Day. Speaking of mothers, I heard a story about a teacher who one day gave her pupils a lesson all about magnets. Someone say magnets. And so the next day she gave them a written test which included the question, my name has six letters beginning with the letter M and I pick up things. What am I? But when the taste papers came back, and they were handed in. She was astonished to find that almost 50%, half the children in her class answered the question, you are my mother. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Now, moms, this is not news to you. Come on. You know you pick things up all the time. As a mom, listen, you don't just have one role. You have multiple roles. Housekeeping, come on, somebody. Uber driver, come on, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cook, uh, appointment manager, nurse, uh, referee when the kids are fighting, teacher, teacher, beautician, disciplinarian, counselor, friend, even if just a loving ear. And the loving ear doesn't stop while they're just kids. Come on. They get older and they still need your ear, right? In my mom's case, if you messed up in my house, she was also the judge, jury, and executioner. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm alive today. <laughs> but in today's world, it's not just those roles. If you're a mama, you have to bring home the bacon as well and fry it up in the pan. So you've got, actually got a lot of roles. And so, and so this morning, I, I, you know, I want to look at the fact that you know, sometimes things are not easy. Especially when, they're, when you're surrounded by a whole lot of drama. And some of the drama is... is Necessary drama, some is unnecessary. Necessary drama, sometimes the kids get sick. Sometimes you're juggling the bills. And unnecessary drama, you, you just have to deal with personalities and conflicts and all sorts of stuff that goes on. And so you're always having to deal with drama. But beyond all the things that you do as moms, I want, you, I want to remind you of something. There is no higher call than that of the mother. Come on, somebody. There's no higher call. And we, can, and we can find godly examples of that throughout the scriptures. We can look at Mo Moses' mother, Jochebed, who took the time to, to, to save her son Moses. And she had to let her son go twice, Amen. not just once, but twice in order to save his life. And she did it because she loved him. Amen? I can look at Samuel's mother, Hannah, who, who gave her up to, to be raised in the house of the Lord. And then he was raised to become a mighty prophet of God. Amen. And we can look at Jesus' mama. Come on, somebody. Who, who as a teenager, she had to go through all she had to do, but she did it, and, and, and every single one of us are blessed for it. Amen? Amen? 
So there's examples all throughout the scriptures of godly mothers. But probably the most known one in terms of giving instructions is that Proverbs 31 template that, that we all know about, that godly woman and mother. And I want to kind of take a look at that or revisit that this morning really quickly. And, and as I revisit it, sometimes when, we talk, when I start to talk about the Proverbs 31 woman, a lot of times if you read it and you compare yourself to it, a, a lot of times women feel less than. But when you look at the scripture as to who is talking, the Bible t tells us that Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs. He, um, he was considered one of the wisest men at the time. And that this particular passage, it, it says in Proverbs 31.1, it says, the sayings of King Lemuel contain, contains this message, um, containing this message, which is uh, the lessons that his mother taught him. And we found out, and when I looked at this, that Lemuel was a, a pseudonym possibly for Solomon himself. And so he was talking about the sayings that his mother taught him. Who was Solomon's mama? Come on, somebody. Anybody? Can, any Bible scholars out there? Who was Solomon's mama? You remember that? What was that? Jeopardy? Solomon's mama. Well, who was his daddy? David, and so his mama would have been, who said that? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And so when you think of Proverbs 31 woman, is Bathsheba the picture that comes to your mind? Is the person who, who is that describing? But I'm telling you, this is, who, this is who he's referring to. This is the advice he's getting. Bathsheba was a godly woman. Oh, yes, she was. And so she gave advice. When you get a chance, you can read the first nine verses. But we're going to pick it up in, in, in verse number 10. And this is what it says. It says, a wife of noble character. It says, who can find a virtuous and capable wife? Someone say a capable wife. She is more precious than rubies. Somebody needs to listen to me this morning. Her husband can trust her. And she will, she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare, to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant's girl. She goes to inspect the field and buys it. With her earrings, she plants a vineyard. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Glasses, someone say glasses. She is energetic and strong. A hard worker, say a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread. Her fingers twisting fiber. She extends her helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. Come on. She makes her own bedspread. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with the other civic leaders she makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions. I love this. With kindness. With kindness. Someone say with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. One translation says, her children stand and call her blessed. One lady said to me, my children stand, but they don't call me blessed. Come on. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Verse 31 says, reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Now again, every few years I like to read this chapter as a reminder of the role that the wife slash mother should have or should ascribe to according to what the Word of God teaches. And again, it's not just women. How many know everybody can learn from this, from this woman? Everyone can learn from this paradigm. Because one of the first things she says is, that I notice is this is not a lazy woman. Come on, somebody. 
This is not a lazy person at all. She ain't sitting at home watching, watching uh, soap operas eating bonbons. She's not wasting her time reading you know, Fifty Shades of Filth. Uh, did I say that? Did that come out of my mouth? <laughs> she is a working woman. In fact, this woman is rocking not just at home, but she's rocking in the marketplace. Look at verse 13 one more time. It says, she finds wool and flax and busily spends it. She's like a merchant ship bringing the food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her whole house and plan the day's work for her servants' girls. Verse 16 says, she goes to inspect the field and she buys it with her earnings and she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong a hard worker. Now, all the mothers in the house know that that mothering role is not for the faint-hearted. Every woman in the house knows that. And oftentimes, when it comes to having to deal with children, they also know it's not just their own children they have to deal with. Come on, somebody. And it's not just the young children, because sometimes, sometimes, Dads, can I say sometimes? Sometimes when I ask how many kids do you have, the ladies will they'll tell me the two that they have, but they'll say, I have three kids. Uh-oh. I said, who's that third kid? I don't even have to ask anymore. They're talking about you, dads. Come on, somebody. In fact, I heard a mother's advice to her daughter. She said, mother to her daughter's advice. She says, cook a man a fish, and you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you'll get rid of him for the whole weekend. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Sometimes it's the grown children in your house that's the hardest to deal with. Where are my ladies at? Come on, somebody. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, you ain't getting a whole lot of help when it comes to the things that matter. And, and so... Now more than ever, we need more of God in our life. Amen? We need more of the influence of the word of God in our lives so that it could permeate our relationships. I, I said, Jesus says, I want you to have a fuller life. And, and part of becoming a fuller life means you've got to leave mediocrity behind. Come on, somebody. You've got to leave the status quo in the past. Some of us are just stuck in the status quo. This is how we've always done it. And all we've done is not cutting it for everybody in the household. And so sometimes you got to leave normal behind and say, you know what, I'm going to leave normal behind, I'm going to leave status quo behind, and I'm going to move toward better. Jesus, help me to be better toward my wife. Jesus, help me to be better toward my husband. Jesus, help me to be better toward the relationships in my life. Amen? Amen. And we know that the, these roles are important to God. It relates to our calling. In fact, in, in Proverbs 31, 30, let me just remind you, ladies, it says, Charm is deceptive, and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Is that on your outline anywhere? Please underline where it says, a woman who fears the Lord. That's the person who's going to be greatly praised as far as God's concerned. Now, we know that charm and beauty are what the world elevates as desirable. And they will go to whatever lengths they need to, they need to define whatever they have to do to accomplish that beauty. They'll, they'll go to the plastic surgeon. They'll do all sorts of things and get this nipped and that tucked and because, because the world says you've got to look a certain way. It reminded me of a story of, of a woman who got in a car accident and, and she died. And, 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 and she went before the Lord and, he, and she said, Lord, is this my time? She says, no, my daughter, that's not your time. I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm sending you back. And so the Lord sends her back and, and she goes and she says, you know what, that's awesome. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a new lease on life. And, and she takes the next few, few days and weeks to start booking to take it, to start booking her time with the plastic surgeon. She's got a nip here and a tuck there, liposuction, the whole nine yards. He said, because the Lord told her, you're gonna, it's not your time, you're going to have a long and fulfilling life. That's what he told her. And so he said, if I'm going to have a long and fulfilling life, I'm going to look good. And she got this nipped and tucked and sucked and everything else. And, 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 and two weeks later, she got in another accident and died. And she stood before the Lord and he said, Lord, I thought you said I'm going to have a long and fruitful life. And the Lord looked at her and said, I, I, I'm sorry, daughter, I didn't even recognize you. <laughs> Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but it's the woman who fears the Lord that's to be praised. 
Amen? Amen. Because the Bible says all of this is passing away. And if you don't think so, listen, listen. Take a trip down memory lane. Just go to your old, do, do we still have photo albums? I know if you're 30 or 40 or older, you still have photo albums, right? All your stuff isn't stored in a phone, right? Come on, somebody. And so we got photo albums, and, and we got high school stuff. And, and go look at your high school pictures. Yes, sir. And, and, and when you look at your high school pictures, you look how you look now, look that, back then, and, that, and, and, and then, or look at your children. And some of us are staring at our children. And, and then now look in the mirror. Come on, somebody. You do what I did. I, I, I took a picture. Look at this picture. This, this was of me and my son on the right. That's me and my son, Ricky, on the left, I mean. Well, you're right. And that's Ricky now grown with his daughter. Help me out, somebody. Am I staring at myself? That was me at 22 maybe 21 22 years old and that's Ricky at 20 something years old same thing now I look at them like oh my goodness I was fairly good looking back then <laughs> and don't even I think I'm good looking now <laughs> did I get an amen on that one that's awesome <laughs> but I look in the mirror now and I see my dad staring back at me Me and John were talking about this yesterday. I'm like, what happened? When did I get so old? And this is what the Bible is talking about. It says, charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. It starts to fade. And if you throw all your eggs in that basket, folks, you're going to be disappointed. That's why the Bible says we need to spend more time not just cultivating the outside uh, or, or the outside beauty. We need to start to cultivate what's going on on the inside. First, uh, First Timothy 4.8 says physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Amen? Because it lasts not just in this life, but in the life to come. You can write that down somewhere. And First Peter 3, 3, uh, 3, 3 through 5 says, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy style, hairstyles and expensive jewelry or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves, listen to me, instead with the beauty that comes from within. Getting quiet in here. The unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. Anybody interested in how the women of old made themselves beautiful? He says it wasn't just in braided hair and the latest fashion and the nip and the tuck and all these things. It was the cultivating of a gentle and quiet spirit. spirit. God. Ladies, we can set the temperature in our house, can't we? Come on, somebody. Amen. What's that saying? If the woman ain't happy? <laughs> and you can walk into a house, you can tell if the woman's happy like right away. Can walk into your office and find saying the same thing. Come on, somebody. Does so anybody know what I'm talking about? Not just ladies, anyone. You you can walk in there and you can tell if somebody is uptight and upset within two seconds. And it ain't pretty. I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care how much makeup you put on, how many times you've been to the you know the plastic surgeon. If you ugly on the inside and it's constantly bubbling out, it's a problem for everybody. And so the Lord and the word says we need to cultivate a gentle and quiet spirit. The question this morning is how do you do that? Well, he tells us it's the woman who fears the Lord. Write that down. It's the woman who fears the Lord. That's the one who's to be praised. That's the role that God wants us to to play in our homes and throughout the day. God wants us to be God-fearing people. Amen. Amen? And by God-fearing, he's not talking about afraid of him. He's talking about one who honors him. Amen. Proverbs 1.7 says, the fear, fear of the Lord is the, help me out somebody, 
the foundation of true knowledge. But fools, look at me, young people. Look at me, young people. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Don't be a fool. Unfortunately, it, it, it seems that this generation that we're raising knows a lot. Come on, somebody. In fact, they act like they... I used to tell some of the young people, listen, I have forgotten more than you know at this point in your life. Come on, somebody. <laughs> a fool despises wisdom. And sometimes you got to go through things before you can get some wisdom. Amen? Amen. And discipline. But I want you to, is that, one, is that one on your outline? I want you to circle where it says uh, the foundation. The foundation. You see, if you were applying makeup, as I understand it, foundation is what you would put on before you applied anything else. Is this true, ladies? Come on, help me out, somebody. Is this something? The foundation is what goes on before you put on the eyeliner and the lipstick and all this other. Before you try to make everything, you got to put on the foundation. Look at me like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm really trying here. So can I just say, to become spiritually beautiful, to develop a gentle and quiet spirit, the Bible says you need the foundational truth of understanding that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. It's your relationship with him and how you relate to him. And again, I'm not talking about being afraid of him. I'm talking about honoring him, having respect for him. Amen? Amen. And respect is going to be in at least two places. It's going to be respect for his house. 2 Thessalonians 3.11, respect for his house. It says, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Anybody know the difference between being busy and a busy body? Paul is addressing a problem that's happening in the church. And he's saying, listen, there's a whole bunch of idle stuff going on. And there's a saying that we all know that idle hands are the devil's workshop. You got nothing to do. And so they're not in just dealing with their own business. They're in everybody else's business. They're not hardworking like the Proverbs 31 woman. They're hardly working. And they're just getting involved in other people's stuff. Not busy, but busy bodies. And as a result, it's disrupting God's house. Ephesians 4, 2 says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make allowances for each other's, help me somebody. False. Why? Because of your love. Anybody in here perfect? I, don't, I, don't, I saw one hand go up, one or two hands. Delusional and perfect, I'm just saying. Of the only one or two hands, aside from those one or two hands, and it was a youth, I'm just saying, I'm not going to call them out. But anybody else in here perfect? I don't know anyone who's perfect. I don't know anyone who has it all together. I know a whole lot of people who are critical of other people. I know a whole lot of people who are always pointing the fingers at other people and pointing out other people's imperfections. You know the rule, right? One finger pointing that way, three pointing back. Come on, somebody. We got to be careful. The Bible says before you can take the log out of someone else's eye or the speck out of someone else's eye, you got to remove the... the log from your own eye. We need to make allowances for each other's faults. We all have them. And he says, do it out of a, your love. Amen. Goes on to say, make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit. Amen. Binding yourself together with peace. How many know we're stronger together? 
Jesus said, listen, listen, listen. He said, a house divided cannot stand. He didn't say might not stand. He says cannot stand. And so we need to strive for unity, not just in your house, but in God's house. Amen? We need to make a decision that love trumps everything else. My Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Amen? Love will work it out even around strange people. And if you're wondering who the strange people are, it's probably you. I'm just saying. But there's grace enough even for you. Amen? There's grace enough even for me in God's house. Jesus said, by this they shall know we are Christ followers. How? Was that my sweetie that said that? She said, by our love for one another. We need to work, walk in love and work at love. Amen. Proverbs 15, 33 says, fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Watch this. And humility precedes honor. Say humility. humility. That person who can't be told nothing, I know it all. The Bible says pride comes before the fall and a haughty heart before destruction. When I'm around, and again, it takes me about two seconds, I don't have to read minds. I can read people's lips. Come on, somebody. And if it, it's all about me and mine and what I'm doing and, and all this stuff and who is she to tell me whatever. Young people, listen to me. You could avoid a whole lot of problems if you just humble yourselves. Amen. The person who won't humble themselves, this is what I do. I like to get out the way. You know why? Because pride comes before the fall. I, I just don't want to be there when, when it happens. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord teaches wisdom, which means I'm going to listen to what God says. I'm going to listen to what his word says. And then humility precedes honor. When I come up against the word and that word contradicts my own thoughts, my feelings, my attitudes, my behavior, and I'm not going to allow pride to well up in me. I don't care what the word says. I don't care what it says about honoring your mom or your dad or your parents. I don't care. When I, they say, Listen, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to humble myself. Amen. And in the process of me humbling myself, God says, oh, look. She gets it. He gets it. And the scripture says in due season, if you humble yourself under the mighty hands of God in due season, he will lift you up. Now let me just tell you this. When God lifts you up, nobody's going to take you down. Come on, somebody. (laughs) When God promotes you, no one's going to take your spot. Oh, I got to worry. Somebody's going to take my spot. No, I don't. Oh, I got to protect everything. I got to protect my little kingdom. No, I don't. I'm not in this by myself. I'm walking low. I'm staying low. You know how I like to stay low? Because if I fall or when I fall, because nobody's perfect. You will catch Pastor Rick on a bad day. I promise you. You hang around me long enough. Yeah, you can catch me on a bad day. And I might say something or do something that, you know, I'm not proud of. David did things he wasn't proud of. But he was called a man after God's heart. You know why? Because he was perfect? No. But Sheba was another man's wife. Come on, somebody. Who he had killed. Who he got pregnant and then he had killed. Oh, yeah. I love the Bible. It tells it all. He was called a man after God's own heart because when he was confronted with his sins and the things that he did, he didn't say, not me, God. He didn't pull a saw and make excuses, justify. He said, against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned. He acknowledged it. He humbled himself. So when I, when I start to say low and I mess up, let me, I, let me just stay low. Let me just stay low. So when I fall, it's a fall from here. 
See, if I, it's a fall from here. If, no, no, no. It's a fall from here. I'd rather fall from here. Than fall from here. Or even here. Turn to someone and say, stay low. Stay humble. You got to have respect for God's house. Let me tell you secondly, you got to have respect for your house as well. Not just your brick and mortar house. Ladies, you control the temperature. Men, you do too. If you don't have a gentle and quiet spirit, everybody knows. Put on all the makeup, comb your hair, do whatever you want. Chanel, group by Fabrice, foundation, walk out your room, ah! uh, ugly, anxious, I'm talking to somebody in here today. But you got to respect your spiritual house too. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? I was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourselves. Listen, listen. For God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Don't you, any believers in the house today? Not ashamed to say, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. Listen to me. God lives in you. And because he lives in you, listen to me, where you go, he goes. And where what you experience, he experiences. And so what you allow to take place in your body, you are taking it with him. I say practice the presence of God. God is with you every single day. Live a life that honors the Father. Some of the times the problem that we're having is because because we're naming, we're saying we're Christians today. And we act like the devil tomorrow. Come on, somebody. We're saying we're Christians today. We come to church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me with the Spirit. Uh, We go off in the Spirit in tongues and whole nine yards. We do whatever. And with that very same tongue. Come on, somebody. And that non-quiet, gentle spirit, you lash out at your husbands or your wives. You take their legs out from under them. It's vitriol and all your kids, you stupid idiot, moron. You listen, And then you wonder why your unsaved husband don't want to come to your church. Come on, that's right, or your kids. So I was saying, if that's your version of Christianity, yeah, I'm just going to leave that alone. Inconsistency. Someone say inconsistency. And so we need to honor God or respect, by respecting our house and our house really is his house, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. As I come to a close this morning, we said mothering is not easy, right? Not and sometimes things get difficult. Yeah. Let me just give you five reminders toward having that fuller house that I believe that God will tell you in this moment. This is what I think that God will tell you. When you feel discouraged, I want you to remember something. That God is with you and will help you. Amen? Amen. That, the scripture says, he's our ever-present help in times of trouble. Isaiah 41.10 says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's got your back. Amen? Amen. When you feel angry, not that it ever happens to anybody in here, right? Right? When you feel angry, remember, don't let the devil in. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. And don't sin 
By letting anger do what? Control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Everybody gets angry, but it says be angry and don't sin. In other words, don't let that anger control you. Amen? Amen. Number three, when you need wisdom, remember to go to Oprah for it. (laughs) Is that what it says? Go to your girlfriend. Where are my married people? Where are my married people that have best friends who are single? I said it. Misery loves company sometimes. My no good husband. My no good is. Hmm, I understand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You should leave that no good. So and so. You know why he's saying that? Because misery loves company. You should go to God. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. The God we serve is not a fault-finding God. Amen? If you need to know, ask him. Amen? Stop shooting from the hip. and Stop shooting off at the mouth. The Bible says it's a gentle and quiet spirit that honors the Lord. Amen? Amen. Number four, when you feel lonely, remember that you're never alone. Hebrews 13.5 says, "Don't don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus speaking, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have, for, have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You know what always means in the Greek? Always. 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 Ta-da. <laughs> Number five. And when you're tired and worried, we come to an end here. And men, don't ever, don't ever be stupid enough to say, you know, why are you tired? <laughs> they have good reasons. When you're tired and worried, remember, he will strengthen you. The Bible says he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless, even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who do what? Trust in the Lord. Isaiah 40, 29 through 31. Those who do what? Trust in the Lord. Will find new strength. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And I love that he uses the words eagles. Because of all the birds out there, he could have said duck. He could have said chicken. Flapping around like a chicken without your hand. He could have said, you know, he could have said a whole bunch of things. He uses eagles. Someone say eagles. Anyone ever notice how the eagle flies? It says they literally mount up with wings as eagles. They just spread their wings and they catch the wind. And God wants you to spread your wings and allow the Holy Spirit to lift you and strengthen you and to give you the power that you need on a day-to-day basis. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to close with this one scripture. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, Pray about everything. Everything. Say everything. Everything. What's too big for God? Nothing. What's too little for God? Everything means everything. 
Everything means everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. I told you, things may be bad, but they ain't all bad. Pulse check. Come on, somebody. Take a deep breath. You got nothing to thank him for? Thank him for your very breath. Thank him that your heart's still beating. But I promise you, if you give him time, if you give him just a moment, you can figure out things to thank him for. And so the Bible says, don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. I can do a service just thanking God for all he's done. Watch this. Listen, listen, listen. Then, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds. Listen, listen. As you, help me somebody, visit Jesus. Tell me, what does it say? As you live in Christ Jesus. Amen. Folks, God wants us to have that peace. And he says it's a peace that passes all understanding. It says, I want you to take your cares and your worries and I want you to cast it on me. He says, I want you to pray about everything. There's nothing too small. God is not too busy. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time and he's omniscient. He knows and he wants you to pour out your needs to him. And then he says, in the process, I want you to thank me for the things I've done, for there are many. And he says, when you get to that place, when you get to that place where you can bring everything to God and you're thankful to him he says something's going to happen in your heart you are going to experience God's peace and he says that peace which exceeds anything we can understand because it's not going to make sense it's not going to make sense while your husband's acting like a knucklehead and you still got peace it's not going to make sense when your kids are cutting up and the Holy Spirit wells up in you and say no 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 why aren't you yelling back at me I, I turned you over to Jesus I got peace come on somebody there is a peace that passes all understanding that doesn't get moved by every, every wind that the enemy's trying and every foul thing's coming out of somebody else. How many of you know you don't have to respond negatively to everything coming out your way? You know why? Because greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. You can allow the Holy Spirit to well up with you in peace. But then he says, listen, 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 listen. listen. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Turn to someone and say, you got to live there. You got to live there. Some of us treat our relationship with Jesus like we treat, a, we treat it like a trip to Disney. Disney, my wife loves Disney. So many people love Disney. I'm not even going to lie to you. I'm not even going to tell you I love Disney. There's so many people that love Disney. And they like to visit Disney, but you can't live at Disney. Not at all. You got to leave. A lot of us treat our relationship with Jesus like it's a trip to Disney. No. I'll come on Sunday, I'll visit for a little while, and then the rest of the week you're doing your own thing. Oh, I have a down moment on Thursday night. Maybe I'll turn on the radio for a minute or two or open the Bible. Visit you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, and then, and then you're wondering why there's no peace. You're wondering why there's not a gentle and quiet spirit being developed. You're like, <laughs> don't, don't raise your hand. I know. I, I get the phone calls. I know what's going on in a, lot of, in a lot of people's hearts. God wants to develop a gentle and quiet spirit in you. But it starts with the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's the foundation. That's before everything else. We got to start with Jesus. And then it says we got to live there. Amen. We got to stay in Christ. And so I just want to, I know we already had our altar. And we're not going to open it up again. It's Mother's Day. I'm going to let you guys go. But I just want to make sure that, that everybody 
who want to accept Christ and to move in that direction. And when I say move in that direction, in order for us to experience things that are better, we have to leave the status quo behind. Amen? I mean, if you want things to improve, you got to leave the normal, whatever your norm is. And sometimes that means humbling your heart, saying, Lord, you know, I need a better relationship. I want to be a better mom. I want to be a better dad. I want to be a... I want to experience the fullness that you have for me. And honest and be honest, you know what? I don't have peace. I want that peace that you have. And so can we just do that for the next few moments? I want everyone to kind of bow their heads and close their eyes. And my number one question is, are you in Christ Jesus? Have you asked Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord? That's your number one thing. Uh, and or are you caught up with everything else that in the end it's just not going to matter? It's just not going to. I'm just letting you know it. Become a God chaser. We had 17, 18 people yesterday make a declaration publicly in front of God and the world that I am a God chaser. I'm going after God with all my heart. And let that be you as well. If you've not yet accepted Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and you would like to, it be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer. Say something like this. Heavenly Father, I want to be in you. I don't want to just visit you. I acknowledge that I've blown it in so many ways. I humble my heart before you this morning. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me of my sins. There are many. I thank you for dying on the cross to pay for every single one of those sins. I acknowledge you as the Christ, the Messiah, my Savior. From this day forward, I don't run from you. I run to you. From this day forward, I don't, I'm not trying to visit. I'm trying to live. So come into my life, come into my heart. I believe, I receive. Fill me with your spirit. And if there's something going on in your life right now that you need God's peace, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that's part of it. You, you, you humble your, you, you, you honor his house, you honor your house, you invite him to come in, and you turn those things over to him. So whatever it is, husband, wife, finances, medical, whatever it is, say, Lord, I turn these things over to you. Please. Give me your peace. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning and you meant it, just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Rick, I prayed with you this morning. I see your hand in the back. I see your hand. I see hands going up all over the place. Praise you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. Father, you saw the hands that have gone up. I pray, Lord, that this wouldn't be the end of a journey with you, but there would be a beginning of a journey, a love journey, a relationship journey that will move from glory to glory to glory. I thank you for your presence in this house today. And I thank you, Father, for every answered prayer. And I pray, Lord, that you would replace anxiety and worry and tiredness and fear with your peace as we learn to live in you. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say. Amen. Amen. Amen.